The Suico 14 to 150 lens for many years has been the ideal optic for travel photography. Olympus have now released a 12 to 200 lens, possibly its successor. It is variable aperture, a difference of two stops between full wide angle and telephoto. This should not be a problem for the experienced photographer as a constant aperture 12 to 200 lens will be too heavy and unwieldy for its main purpose, travel photography. The lens was on loan from Olympus, but I had heard reports about it being a little soft in respect of its sharpness at full telephoto. As a creative photographer, I have experimented with shots taken at 200mm at f6.3, its widest aperture on telephoto. I am not a techie, but they look okay to me. I give you photographs as testimony, not charts. Therefore, this program is an experience, not a review. I leave that up to others who are better qualified. I spent a week with the lens and the EM1 Mark II in Scotland, visiting three islands, Mull, Iona and Butte, with brief visits to Oban and Glasgow, not to mention a few friends. In my rucksack I had the 12-50 as backup, which I didn't use, no extra gear, except my iPad, a toothbrush and, oh yes, a, a clean shirt. I stayed in ensuite B&Bs with telly and Wi-Fi and travelled first class by train, which included a cooked breakfast with black pudding and wine with a meal for dinner. Less is more. Anything else is superfluous. Before the planned Scottish outing, I tested the new lens on my local common, followed by a day trip to Berry St Edmunds for its cathedral and Ickworth House. All was encouraging. I had a few hours to kill in Glasgow, so true to expectations, I toddled off to St Mungo's, Glasgow's Presbyterian Cathedral. Light was low and mixed, so I cheated by putting white balance on auto, which I find successful in these quite tricky situations. Keeping ISO at 200, essential if you want your work published, I relied on the camera's stabiliser for sharp handheld pictures and it worked beautifully. Unlike the 12 to 100, the 12 to 200 does not have its own image stabilizer, but I only had one shaky shot, so that was deleted. I was restricted by an exhibition in the nave and repair work in the choir. The lower church, yes, St Mungo's is unusual in having two churches, one on top of the other. Anyway, it was clear of works but not people. I might surprise you to admitting that the camera mode was set to program. In low light, the camera will default to its widest aperture, and with the variable aperture 12 to 200, well that can be anything from factor 3.5 through to 6.3, dependent on the zoom setting. In good light, the shutter speed becomes the default on program, usually to the fastest practical working shutter speed for hand holding. Of course, you are not in control, and it won't help depth of field, but useful if a quick shot is needed. When I am in serious photographer mode, I normally take my shots on aperture priority, but even in program as here, Everything seems to come right, even depth of field, one of the hidden benefits of micro four thirds, even at a quarter of a second at factor 3.5. Ah.
<sighs> Don't I just hate instant gratification? My resolve was severely tested for this shoot around Oban. The skies were overcast, but popping some gorse in the foreground warmed the colours a bit, adding some life to the image. Take a look at this shot of Dunstaffinage Castle. The sky is overexposed because the castle walls need more exposure. As the dynamic range is not too great, Lightroom came to my rescue. Alternatively, I could underexpose by spot metering the sky, allowing the walls to become darker, but again correcting in Lightroom. If the dynamic range was greater, you would either have burnt out highlights impossible to correct or noise through lightening the underexposed castle walls. It is the wrong sort of light for general shots, but perfect for close detail. Soft light works wonders for patterns and textures, and even my valiant attempt at wildlife photography. But the pigeons, perched on a ledge over the old kitchen, may end up in a pie if they are not careful. Taking further advantage of early seasonal leaf and the soft light, I tried a close-up by using the extended telephoto zoom to reduce depth of field. It was easy to throw the background out of focus as it had a harmonising hue. The next day I went by ferry to Mull, but it was just as dull. Now my salvation was the ancient woodland in Torresy Estate near Craignure, especially tree roots covered by lichen and mosses, making them look like grotesque creatures. I wandered around for a couple of hours, even found an early rhododendron, but the moment you retreat the weather springs a surprise. Whoopee! Here at last comes the sun. It has transformed the ferry port at Craig Newer that earlier looked rather dull, a classic case of being in the right place at the right time. I am not a fan of gloomy landscapes. Moody, yes, but there is a subtle difference, and whilst much of my published work requires a lovely blue sky, I do like a bit of drama at times. The next day looked more promising, but it was a false omen. Destination was Iona and its abbey. Fortunately, the persistent cloudy skies were perfect for its interior, and not being yet in season, I almost had the abbey to myself. My attention soon diverted to the marvellous texture and detail in the cloister carvings, and I played around with depth of field. Who said differential focusing was not possible with micro four thirds? Later, under lightning skies, I walked one mile north to the white strand of the monks, a silvery beach that responded well to the brief flashes of sunlight illuminating the seascape had to work quickly here, as well as the sudden opportunities to freeze water with shutter priority. Returning to the mainland from Mull, I seemed to have the Calmac ferry to myself. It was, however, the start of the summer timetable, and this was the extra sailing new for that day. I was heading for the island of Butte, and, travelling by train, I was looking forward to seeing the wonderful architecture of Weems Bay Station, surely one of the best and most original. It was designed in 1903 by James Miller for the Caledonian Railway, and then restored between 2014 and 2016. There are five platforms, but now only with two currently in service for trains from Glasgow Central. It is only a two-minute walk to the Caledonian McBrain Ferry for Rothsay. Early cloud soon cleared, revealing a glorious sunny day, and then 
as if by magic, a bus suddenly appeared bound for Mount Stuart, a stately home grand enough to rival anything, so my mind was suddenly made up. Photography was allowed inside, whoopee, so I joined the 11.30 party pretty darn quick, but remained discreetly at the back of the group. Light was extremely variable, but I could keep the ISO at 200 for maximum quality, relying on the camera's image stabilizer for sharp handheld photographs. For this shot, the shutter speed was an eighth of a second, helped of course by holding breath and two stout legs, which unfortunately are not good enough for public exhibition, let alone a picture. Incidentally, the red glow in the chapel's lantern is not artificial. Yes, I know it looks it, but it's not. It is sunlight projected through intense red stained glass. Arriving at the property as soon as it opened its doors to the public and early in the season enabled me to achieve classic views of the house without people. Just for the record, here, from the same spot, are two images showing the incredible range of this lens from 12 millimeters right through to 200. After exploring the grounds, I walked back to Rosse via the West Island Way, and it was quite a way, over five miles, but the views, yes, they were fantastically good. My second full day on Butte took me into Rosse, where I found the Victorian toilets, but as they wanted 40p for a pee, eight shillings in old money, I spare you the interior. Therefore, cross-legged, I took the bus to Kilcutton Bay, near the southern tip of Butte. I explored the coast path, a grade one walk for scenery, enhanced by, and purely by chance, the Navy conducting exercises in the Firth of Clyde. I have never seen so many warships in one place. Here the lens was invaluable for getting in close, impossible for the 12 to 100 despite its excellence. Rounding the point, I marvelled at the distant mountains on Arran, which in the past I have actually climbed, before journeying on to the romantic ruins of St Blaine's Church. I timed my return to Rosse perfectly for evening light on harbour buildings, before retiring to my hotel for Merlot sustenance. My train home from Glasgow Central was not until mid-afternoon, so once more I had a couple of hours to kill. 
Whilst visiting St. Mungo's the week before, it was recommended that I should pay a visit to St. Andrew's, the Roman Catholic Cathedral near the Clyde. Just managed a 30-minute shoot before confessions and mass, preferring instead to take wine at the Virgin First Class Lounge on Central Station. This train was my transport home, but I might have thumbed the lift on this. I did try a little wave. Cooey!